Happy Valentine's Day, everyone. My name is Dean Adrian K. Wing, and I am the director of the University of Iowa Center for Human Rights. I am also the Bessie Dutton Murray Distinguished Professor of Law and the Associate Dean for International and Comparative Law Programs. Our sponsors today include UICHR, the Tippy College of Business, the Black Law Student Association, and the Law School DEI Committee. Founded in 1999, UICHR is involved in programming that reaches people at the University of Iowa, Iowa City, throughout our state, nation, and beyond. Since the pandemic, we have held over 100 virtual events with over 8,000 viewers. It is my pleasure to introduce today's speaker for Black History Month, Mr. Clarence Otis Jr. Mr. Otis was born in Vicksburg, Mississippi and grew up in the Watts neighborhood of Los Angeles. He holds a bachelor's degree from Williams College where he graduated magna cum laude and Phi Beta Kappa. I met him in 1979 when I was a 1L and he was a 3L at Stanford. We were both very active in Balsa and became good friends. Neither of us could imagine the paths our respective careers would take. If someone had told me that Adrian Wing, who was born in California and grew up in the New York area, would be a law professor for 35 years in Iowa with seven kids, that would have been impossible. Well, let me tell you Mr. Otis's story uh, as well. Uh, Clarence graduated from Stanford in 1980 and started his legal career in a very typical way for Stanford grads. He was a securities lawyer in New York City, practicing for several years. He then did something a little less traditional, and he entered the financial services industry. He later led the Municipal Securities Group of Chemical Securities. Clarence started at Darden Restaurants in 1995, joining the company as treasurer and then later becoming chief financial officer. Then he did something rather rare for lawyers and totally unique for black lawyers. He became the CEO of Darden Restaurants from, 20, from 2004 to 2014 and its chairman from 2005 to 2014. Black CEOs make up a tiny fraction just 1% of the Fortune 500. There have only been 18 Black CEOs on the Fortune 500 list since 1999. The peak was six in 2012 during the time when Mr. Otis was a CEO. As a S&P 500 company, Darden is the world's largest full service restaurant company with annual revenues that exceed $8 billion, over 160,000 employees, and its brands include Olive Garden, Longhorn Steakhouse, Cheddar's, Capitol Grill, Bahama Breeze, Seasons 52, Yard House, and formerly Red Lobster. While achieving strong operating and financial results, as well as having a serious commitment to diversity and inclusion, in 2011, when Clarence was the CEO, Darden became the first full service restaurant company to be named one of Fortune Magazine's 100 Best Places to Work and it achieved this distinction for four consecutive years. After his time at Darden, Clarence is at a new phase in his career. He currently serves on the board of Verizon, 
where he is the lead independent director. He is also on the board of directors of VF Corporation, Travelers Companies, Union Square Hospitality Group, and Jazz at Lincoln Center. And he is the chair for the Jazz at Lincoln Center board. He is also a member of the National Board of Governors of the Boys and Girls Clubs of America. And he's on the board of trustees of the Cleveland Clinic. He has received an honorary degree from his alma mater, Williams College, and was inducted as a lifetime member in the Horatio Alger Association of Distinguished Americans. Please join me, Iowa, in welcoming Mr. Clarence Otis, who is speaking on a fabulous topic, becoming an effective leader, especially when you're Black. After he finishes his main talk, as usual, you will be able to put questions into the Q&A, which I will moderate. So welcome to Iowa virtually, uh, Clarence. Unmute yourself there. There we go. You'd think after a couple of years, we'd be <laughs> pros at this. Uh, but Adrian, thank you so much. Uh, I am delighted to have this opportunity to spend some time with you this afternoon, uh, really participating in this year's Black History Month celebration. And I know it's especially challenging uh, to be able to do something like this under the circumstances. So I really salute the leadership team that has organized this year's uh, activities. And I especially want to salute my lifelong friend, Adrian Wing. Now, when I'm asked, as I have been today, uh, to make remarks about becoming an effective leader, uh, it's always difficult. And it's difficult because, as Adrian noted, I've had a series of careers, a series of jobs, a series of experiences. And as Professor Wing said, I started as a corporate securities lawyer, uh, had a, uh, a long career in investment banking, uh, and then a move to Darden, uh, where I began a seven year stint as a finance leader before spending two years running one of our, our business units, uh, and then 10 years as the CEO of DART. And so it's certainly an understatement to say that my professional leadership progression had no logical linear trajectory. What's important though, is that the lack of obvious planfulness that I'm admitting to is just not unique. And that shouldn't be too surprising. It shouldn't be surprising because life in general and the work world in particular are simply too dynamic really for a whole lot of planning to be useful. So given that, what I've come to believe is that becoming an effective leader in the business community or in any community that you choose to participate in is a lot less about doing the right planning and a lot more about engaging in the right kind of preparation. And if that is in fact the case, then the key question really is what does someone need to do to prepare himself or herself to become an effective leader and that's what I'd like to spend our time uh, together exploring. What good preparation for effective leadership really involves. As I think about my particular path and the many strong leaders that I've encountered, encountered rather along the way, I've come to believe that effective leadership begins with one thing, and that's very strong self-awareness. That is the foundation that I think any good leader has to have, regardless of what arena they're participating in. To me, strong self-awareness has a number of dimensions to it. For sure, it means having a good understanding of who you are, 
So your values, your traits, your preferences, those that you're proud of, and equally important, those that you're not proud of, those that you wish you could change. In addition to having strong self-awareness really does mean that uh, you understand what you're trying to accomplish, both in your life and with the work that you do and why. Or said another way, it means that you have a good understanding of what I refer to as your personal core purpose. So let's pause and explore that concept a little. Let's talk about what I mean by personal core purpose. As I think about what people work for, there's no question that everyone works for personal benefit. Each of us works, for example, uh, to be rewarded materially for what we do. So that we can be well compensated enough to secure some of the things and some of the experiences that we enjoy. We also work to be rewarded egoistically, to receive individual personal recognition and the self-esteem boost that comes with that. But I've found that the people who are the most effective leaders in any organization or any movement, those who, who rise to the top work for something more. There's some larger contribution that they want to make. And that's important. It's important because having a reason for working, a personal core purpose that involves something larger than himself or herself serves these leaders very well in a number of different ways. First, with any job, any assignment, no matter how much you might enjoy it, there are grueling, stressful tasks and periods associated with, it, with that job. There are also extended periods of time when what you're doing can be tedious and it can be stifling. And in my experience, the people who power through these periods with high levels of energy and engagement and who thereby demonstrate strong leadership potential or strong leadership effectiveness, they don't do it because of what they're paid or the recognition they might receive, although both of those things certainly help. They do it because they're motivated by a compelling core purpose that has at its center making a difference for other people. And through the tough times, that core purpose and those who are gonna benefit from its realization are always top of mind. But having a, a core purpose that's larger than oneself also serves someone well because that's what it takes to develop followership and sponsorship. I'm convinced that no matter what combination of strengths you bring to the table, people will not follow you unless they see that you're working in service of others that that is a dominant motivation for what you do. And I'm equally convinced that again, no matter what you bring to the table, unless people will not be inspired to be passionate sponsors of your development and your advancement, unless they see that you're working again for something larger than yourself. Finally, I believe that you're well served by having a personal core purpose behind your work, that one that's larger than yourself, one that involves working in service of others, because when it's all said and done, what you've done for others is what will have made the tremendous amount of time and energy that you will have invested in your work worth it. It's what will have made your lifelong commitment to your work truly fulfilling. Now invariably, a person's personal core purpose reflects his or her life experiences. And that's certainly true for me. As Adrian said, I grew up in Los Angeles in the Watts section of the city. An inner city, 
Black and Latino neighborhood with all of the well-known challenges that that suggests. And yet, despite all that, I thrived. And so did many of the kids that I grew up with. And we thrived because a host of people, teachers, youth volunteers, small business people, corporate leaders and others were there to help us. First and foremost, they convinced us that we mattered, even though we were enveloped by so much that said otherwise. And they did that by helping us understand the black experience in America and why it was that people who indeed matter were living in communities like Watts. They convinced us that given the black experience in America, we were at a moment in time where for young people like us, there was a world of opportunity. There was a world of opportunity beyond Watts, provided, provided that we were willing to work to prepare ourselves to take advantage of the opportunity. And finally, they worked hard to help us with that preparation. Now I wanna be clear, growing up in Watts and coming to understand the black experience in America didn't just make me aware of how much we as a people had already accomplished and could accomplish going forward. These experiences also made me acutely aware that as a people, we were far from thriving. And that in order to change that, we had to change important institutions and systems in our country so that there were more opportunities for black people. And also, in addition to that, it made me realize that we had to change ourselves. We had to continue to heal ourselves psychologically and emotionally so that we'd be better prepared to take advantage of those opportunities. And as a result, of that personal history, as I started my career in the corporate world, my personal core purpose, that larger contribution I wanted to make as part of my work was to help build a stronger, healthier, and more vibrant Black community, to be part of the effort to ensure that more of those in our community would fully realize their potential. Now, as I've grown, my personal core purpose has evolved. And so now I have come to think of it really as helping build a stronger and more interesting America, a stronger and more interesting world by ensuring that every community of people in our country, especially the black community and other communities of color is healthy and productive and free of the pathologies that we've built up around race, around gender, and around other differences. Pathologies that, in my view, limit our individual and collective aspirations. And so all of that is to say that when I think about what constitutes the right preparation for becoming a successful leader, it all starts with having the right foundation. And again, for me, that is strong self-awareness that is grounded in two things, a clear sense of who you are and the right motivation or personal core purpose for your work, one that involves something larger than yourself. I would say though that even if that is all in place, there's still a very important question you have to ask yourself. And it's a question that a lot of people don't take time to ask. You have to ask yourself, will I be able to realize my core purpose in the arena that I put myself in? Is that arena one that is truly relevant to what I'm interested in accomplishing?
It's a critical question. It's critical because to be an effective leader, you have to believe without any doubt that your chosen arena uh, is one where you can accomplish the things that are most important to you. If you aren't, if you aren't absolutely convinced that that's the case, then you won't be able to make the sacrifices that are required to rise to the top. If, however, if the answer to that all important question is yes, and the arena you've chosen for yourself is the right one for you, then beyond strong self-awareness, what else do you need to prepare yourself to become a successful leader? Well, I believe good preparation involves three more things. Having voracious curiosity, dreaming big dreams, and developing meaningful expertise or know-how about something that's important in the line of work that you choose. Now, let me start with, with curiosity, because for me, after strong self-awareness, that's the most essential component of leadership effectiveness. What I mean by curiosity is an unending desire to know about all the important things in life. Things like the people I encounter. I find tremendous value in wanting to know who each person is, how he or she treats others, what he or she thinks about others, about issues. How does this person reach conclusions? Why is the person the way he or she is? How does he or she compare to other people I know? The desire to know about things like the place where I am or the place where I'm going. What are the important characteristics of this community, this city, this region, or this nation? How did it come to be the way that it is? And that list goes on and on and on. This kind of curiosity does something very important. It helps you put things in context. It helps you understand why people, organizations, and circumstances are the way they are. And with a, a solid understanding of who you're dealing with and the environment you're operating in, I believe that you're better positioned to make good, informed decisions. Without that, it'll be hard to take any degree of control of your environment. In fact, you risk being buffeted about by that environment, being one of those people that things just seem to happen to. And I think it's, it's particularly important that African Americans understand context. Because given our history, we, more than most other people, are engaged in a very intensive effort to forge an identity. Not search for one, but to create one. Create one out of the fragments that we've inherited as a result of our unique history. And that's a large part of what your activities this year are all about. One of the things that you're trying to do is to forge an identity for black students who will soon enter the workforce. And you're starting as you should. You're starting by trying to understand black people's current experiences in the world and trying to put those experiences in context. Now, another reason why I believe understanding context is so important for African Americans in particular is because there's so much negative misinformation out there about us that if we're not intentional and disciplined in trying to put things in appropriate perspective, it's easy for us to internalize very, very negative self-images. And as a result of that, impose limits on what we think we can accomplish. 
Now, I've seen the, the value of curiosity and putting things in context many, many, many times during my professional career. I found, for example, that everyone recognizes that to perform well, you have to know certain details about your assignment or your job. What am I trying to accomplish with this project or in this role? What challenges am I tasked with responding to? And while not everyone takes the time or puts in the effort to know these things, everyone knows that they should if they want to be a solid performer. What I call leadership level curiosity takes you further than that. It drives a person to want to know the larger context. As I said, I started my career as a securities lawyer. And I started out, as Professor Wing said, at a very large New York City law firm, where I saw this kind of drive in the young partner that I worked with most closely, a lawyer by the name of Peter Cole. Years later, Peter went on to become the managing partner of that firm. But 15 years before he got to that position, he was interested in a series of things about our firm and about each of our clients. Peter was the kind of professional who wanted to know what's this team or department trying to accomplish? How does this assignment or job that I have contribute to that? What are the goals and objectives of the business unit? What are the strategies for achieving these? How does my department fit in? How do other departments come into play? What's the mission of the firm as a whole? What are its goals? its objectives, its strategies, and how do these compare? How do these compare to those of the firm's direct competitors? And what explains really the differences between them and us? Peter taught me that to become an effective leader, you need to have sufficient curiosity to constantly ask those kind of questions and seek the answer to those questions. Whether you're an entry-level employee, a young manager, a more seasoned manager, or a senior executive. Now, the final thing I'll say about curiosity is that the older I get, the more I realize that as a community and as individual leaders, Black people have to make sure that we have as much curiosity and that we are as uh, and probing about others as we demand that they be about us. We also have to recognize that no matter how curious I think I am about a person or a community who is not black, that person or community is never going to open up to me and be profoundly revealing of himself, herself, itself, unless I am open and profoundly revealing of myself in exchange. Now, when you have the kind of curiosity that it takes to engage effectively with others, both inside and outside the workplace, this, this leadership level of curiosity that I've described, and as a consequence of that, you understand the context within which you live and work, then you're able to do another thing that effective leaders do. You're able to dream big dreams. There are a lot of people in the world who have a wide ranging intellect, as well as great relationships with others. And as a result of that, they know a lot of things they know a lot of people. They have a good grasp of why things are the way they are. On top of that, many of those folks who have these virtues are also willing to work hard. And yet, they're not viewed within their organizations as effective leaders or as having strong leadership potential. Instead, they're often described as strong individual contributors. We all know people like that. Many times, the reason they're viewed the way 
they are is they don't use their intellect, their knowledge, and their relationships to fuel big dreams. Instead, for their content, to focus almost all of their energies on the specific job in front of them. They're satisfied with stringing together a series of successes on specific tasks or job assignments. And really, those successes do make a difference. They do add up to incremental linear improvement. And that's important. It's important, but it's not enough to create followership. To create followership, I believe you have to start by envisioning and communicating to other people a fundamentally new reality. One that aligns with and supports the accomplishment of both your personal core purpose and the strategic interests of the organization or the movement that you're involved with. And what that does is two things. First, by providing people with a compelling vision, a big dream, if you will, you'll inspire them to do an even better job with the familiar basics so that they're truly delivering all the steady improvement, all the incremental improvement that they and the organization are capable of. But secondly, it takes a big dream to inspire people to work on new things and to work in different ways. And that is how you get them to produce exponential, nonlinear improvement. And it's both types of successes, steady progress and exponential improvement that turn big dreams into reality. So if you have leadership level curiosity, and as a result of that, you have a good grasp of the situation, so much so that you dream big dreams, you paint pictures of a new reality that inspires others, and all of that rests on a stable foundation of strong self-awareness, then what else goes into preparing yourself to be a successful leader? I believe that final piece is that you need to be able to do the work, the heavy lifting of executing. You have the curiosity to develop both a broad range of knowledge and trusting and supportive relationships with a diverse group of colleagues. And because of that, you're good at dreaming big dreams, then you're well prepared to play a key role in strategy development. But your leadership effectiveness is going to be limited if you aren't able to be equally valuable in strategy execution, in doing the work to make the strategies real. And that's where it helps to have expertise in an area that's meaningful. And that simply means that someone with expertise in the area can be impactful in your organization or your industry or in the global work arena. There are just a, a couple of points I'd like to make here. The first is that something that you hear all the time, and you hear it all the time because it's true. You should seek to develop expertise in an area that you have passion for. And that's because without a passion for something, You'll never be the best at it, a true expert. You could have solid functional knowledge and skills, but without passion for what you're engaged in, you won't ever be the kind of difference maker that really defines true leadership. My second point here is I also believe it's difficult to, to put in the effort to build expertise unless you're at a place that you like. You've gotta be able to embrace 
an organization. And you've got to believe that if you give the organization reason to, it will embrace you in return. And I think the key to, to that kind of relationship between a person and his or her organization is for that person's personal foundation or core purpose to be consistent with the core purpose and strategic interest of the organization. Again, what are you trying to do beyond getting the work done and why? And what's the organization trying to do and why? Now, one very important point, uh, a piece rather of information advice that I would give you on this point is you have to be completely honest with yourself at all times. So before concluding that your aspirations and an organization's aspirations aren't aligned or that an organization doesn't see your full leadership potential. And based on that conclusion, making the decision to leave an organization, ask yourself, am I doing everything I need to do to build a solid foundation for leadership? And I say that because you know where I ended my career, but I know how I got there. And two law firms and three investment banks later, I realized that some of those changes were absolutely essential. But I also knew that at least a couple of those moves set me back. If I'd had even greater self-awareness, been more open to constructive feedback and made some of the personal changes I needed to make earlier, I would have saved some time and I would have had a whole lot more fun along the way. And that's really the, the final observation. As you prepare yourself to be an effective leader, starting with a strong sense of who you are and what you want to accomplish. And you build on that by developing leadership level curiosity so that you can formulate big dreams and by developing meaningful expertise so that you can help make the strategies and the dreams real. You should also make sure that you have fun along the way. Because if it's not fun, at least some of the time, it's not going to be worth it. So I hope these observations have been helpful to you. And again, I appreciate this opportunity to participate in this year's uh, Black History celebration. So thank you so much. Wow. Thank you so much, Clarence. I was taking notes <laughs> just like any student. Uh, as you know, here our co-sponsors include the College of Law and the College of Business. And so I am sure uh, the students listening eagerly to, to what can we learn from you, but also for those of us who are uh, a bit older, uh, maybe coming toward uh, the, the pinnacle or the the latter parts of our careers in different professions, what you had to say was, was so, uh, so meaningful and so important. And you know, you're the exemplar that you did it coming from incredibly humble background. You weren't three generations of Ivy Leaguer uh, stepping up in, into that situation that was made for you. And so um, I know uh, I'm very grateful for this wisdom. And so we have some time here uh, to have some Q&A. Okay. And I have a question. Um, <clears throat> here is someone saying, with the personal experience of turmoil of growing up in Watts, the well-known 1965 uh, riots, are recent events any different in your opinion? in what can and should be learned for young Americans? Well, uh, I think there are some, some, some big differences and some big similarities, right? And so 
Uh, one of the similarities is, you know, the, the really, you know, war between the police and communities like Watts. So that is not new. I mean, Watts uh, riots of 65 were set off by a police incident, a police stop of a woman and her sons, and, and that led to it. And that um, trigger uh, really was because you had a police force uh, that was, in fact, oppressive at war with the community. And when I think about it, I think about the difference between sort of the South and the North and the West, places like what. So in the South, you had you know, legal segregation. Uh, and in the North, you didn't have those laws, uh, but you had a point of view that uh, black people and white people shouldn't mix. And no laws, but the police force was tasked with enforcing that separation. And so you had a police force that was uh, violent, <laughs> disrespectful. You still have that. And so you've got police forces across the country that are tasked with keeping white spaces white. And so when black people enter those spaces, they're challenged by police uh, just for being there. So that, that's very similar. Nothing really has changed there. I think the difference is that with um, 60 years of history, you know, with the riot in Watts, with the riots a couple of years later in Detroit and Newark, and the year following that with Kings assassinated in 68 across the country, with the riot in the early 90s again in Los Angeles, I think people realize that that anger and frustration needs to be better channeled. And so you do have movements, political movements today that are much more intentional about addressing some of these issues. And so that's a positive. Thank you. Uh, here's another one. I love uh, Mr. Otis's message on regards to knowing oneself and having curiosity. My question is, what does self-care uh, in the business world look like for him when there are many demands as a leader? Can he provide an example of what a strong partnership looks like? Well, I would say uh, uh, it really starts with uh, the recognition that a company, a business, any organization is a social organization. And you spend a lot of time in that social organization. So it's not, I've got a job, then I have a life. It's not, oh, this company that I'm part of is a social organization, just like all the other social organizations that I'm part of. And so I should be able to find people there that I can develop really profound relationships with that are supportive of me uh, as a person. And so if you approach the work world with that mentality, I think you'll find colleagues uh, that, you know, sort of help you with your self-care, just like you would find in any other segment of your life. So that's always been part of it to me. I mean, it's a social organization. So this notion of, well, I don't bring my whole self to work is kind of odd because work is the social system, just like the social clubs you're involved with, just like family. And so I think you can look to work to develop those kind of relationships, whether at the institution you work in or, or among the industry that you work in, in those industry organizations, professional organizations, whether it's your function, finance, or your industry, in my case, restaurants. And so I've always not seen a big dichotomy there. I work with people that are true friends. 
that I could rely on them uh, to bounce things off of. <clears throat> um, as, as we've indicated, you are in a, a very rare circle in terms of Blacks who have been a CEO. Um, and I, I wonder if you could uh, mention about some of the efforts that these current and former CEOs, uh, most of them I believe would be boomers uh, like ourselves, uh, for things that, that they have done collectively, maybe behind the scenes, maybe not behind the scenes in terms of uh, trying to advance, um, you know, the black people uh, yep. in America and uh, so forth. And I think you, you have personally been involved in some of these efforts. Well, I would say a, a couple of things. One is, um, you know, we've benefited tremendously from timing. And so when you look at the history of black people in the country, you know, the civil rights movement, uh, the riots, the response to those riots with uh, Johnson's War on Poverty, all those programs, I benefited from many of them. Uh, what you saw was uh, majority institutions, educational institutions open up to black students. And so we were the first black students to arrive on those campuses. So the flagship public university campuses, Ivy League campuses uh, in critical mass. There have always been some. I went to Williams, Sterling Brown went to Williams. He graduated in the first decade of the 20th century. Um, there were people there before him, but we were the first in mass. And so when you think about that, you know, getting there in the late 60s, early to mid 70s, uh, and you think about the timeline for senior corporate leadership, where sort of people get there at 50, then you've got a group of folks like myself, you know, Ken Chenault at American Express, Ken Frazier at Merck, that's the timeline. So we were the benefits of a lot of effort that resulted in us sort of being at that moment in time where we could advance to these positions. And I think all of us recognize that that is the privilege that we were offered through the works of others. And then, so there was this um, mission that you inherited to advance Black people inside your organization and make your organization more diverse. Uh, in the business world and socially overall, because it's a megaphone, you have a, a big platform. And so people did a lot of things. Um, when you look at the Fortune 500 and see the number of CEOs, it looks like not a lot of movement. But the reality is when you look below that, there's been incredible progress. And so if you look at the Russell 2000, you'll see a lot more uh, than five. You won't see 100, but you'll see a lot more than five uh, black uh, CEOs. When you look below the CEO spot at other senior leaders, the numbers are huge. I joined the Executive Leadership Council, which is senior corporate black leaders in 95. There were like 60 of us. Today, there's 600 in that organization, and it doesn't include all of the black senior leaders by any, any uh, measure. Uh, so that's progress. I think we all feel like we contributed to that progress. You also need to speak out when, um, when called for. And so, for example, last year, as a lot of states were rushing to pass laws that ultimately were designed uh, to restrict Black voting, uh, Ken Chenault, the uh, former chairman and CEO of Amex, and Ken Frazier at that time was still the CEO. He sit, stepped down for that job. He's still chairman at Merck. And myself organized an effort where senior Black leaders uh, purchased uh, an ad in the, in the New York Times 
and we called on uh, corporate leaders across the country to speak out about it because it was that important. Otherwise, this is something that would have been done quietly and pretty much under the radar. So that's a, a recent example. It didn't stop these laws, but a lot of them got changed. And so they were a little less damaging. And it's mobilized a lot of people that are determined uh, to peel back those laws or to, um, to really limit or reduce their effectiveness by uh, engaging in serious voter turnout. But it was the moment where we felt like a lot of people just a year before it talked about their commitment uh, to equity, racial equity. And here we were uh, really attacking the thing that has resulted in inequity, uh, which is the right to vote. The fact that the vote was taken from two thirds of the black people in the country uh, from call it 1885 until 1965 is the reason why there's inequity. And so how can you talk about dealing with inequity and allow that kind of, of, uh, of reversion to occur? Okay, our time is uh, running out. And <laughs> so I'll take one, I have one uh, question in the, the Q&A, and it will require a tight, a tight answer. Okay. And, okay. and so uh, this person says, what would you have told your younger self in regards to your identity and experience as a Black American? Uh, what's the one thing you told yourself as you were among the only in your field that helped you persevere? So, I mean, you gave us a whole lecture. But yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I would say the, the one thing that, that I always told myself, um, and I think it's, it's worth repeating, because I hear people talk a lot about imposter syndrome. I don't belong here, I'm guilty. I never felt that way. So I always told myself, I certainly belong here. I earned the right to be here. Um, so that, you know, I think that's what I would tell myself. I grew up, as I said, went to a school that was, was the worst school in the LA system academically. And when I got to Williams, I wasn't adrift. I was well prepared. And so you got to tell yourself, I belong here. You know, even with these inequities, um, you can meet this challenge. Thank you very much. Uh, you, you are a, a shining example uh, of the best of what we all can achieve in this country when given uh, the opportunities that uh, you had and that you took up and that um, you are still uh, engaged in, and I'm sure you will be engaged in activities um, in uh, various uh, fora uh, for the rest of your time. Uh, our um, time is uh, running out, so I have to close out this session, and I have to uh, make some announcements. So I'd like to first, uh, of course, thank you for your time, your energy, your frankness in zooming into Iowa. Uh, I don't know if you'll ever get here in person, uh, but uh, uh, if you do, we would uh, welcome you. Um, so let's thank uh, Mr. Otis once again, as well as all of our sponsors. Um, I would also like to thank UICHR tech guru, uh, Erica Christensen for all of her efforts. This event, is taped and will be on our website for UICHR, which is uichr.uiowa.edu. And you will find our entire webinar collection there. I'm going to uh, tell you all about uh, some upcoming events. So you can see on the slide as part of Black History Month, 
uh, we will have a special virtual screening of an award-winning uh, documentary short called Becoming Black Lawyers. And it will be followed up with a Q&A by the filmmaker who is Evangeline Mitchell, an Iowa Law alum. Uh, in addition to this event, um, we are having a uh, series by UICHR that will be dealing with climate change. And the first uh, event for this will be this Wednesday, and it will be on evolution of science and policy. In addition to these events, we don't have a slide for this, I want to call everyone's attention to the fact that on Friday, February 25th, we will have a former Iowa professor, Paul Gowder, African-American, who now teaches at Northwestern, discussing his new book, which is called The Rule of Law in the United States, An Unfinished Project of Black Liberation. It is sure to be a fantastic event. It will be sponsored by the College of Law uh, Speakers Committee. So uh, in conclusion, uh, we hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of Valentine's Day and that this has been one of the wonderful uh, intellectual nuggets that you will enjoy this day. And so everyone, uh, we look forward to seeing you at our future events. Thank you all very much.